What we're going to do is uh, uh, we have a number of members who are going to be here, and uh, we want to uh, and we put them in an order that they uh, made the request. And so we'll start off with myself, Senator Risch, Ernst, and Portman, and then uh, each one of them has the order so they can pass it on to the next one. All right? So we have uh, Russia, they're continuing to build up. We know what they're doing. We see every day the, the Ukrainian borders. The best way the United States can support our friends in Ukraine is to uh, quickly deliver additional aid and bolster Ukraine's defenses. The administration is about three months behind where they should be uh, at this time. Uh, sadly, this is history repeating itself. When Russia first invaded Ukraine in 2014, the Obama administration initially failed to send military aid. Only after my colleagues and I sent a legal minimum on funds for lethal defenses defensive aid back in 2017 did things really get started and you might remember that was when we had our defense authorization bill the ndaa where we put the uh, legal minimum on funds for lethal defense uh, to make sure that got done many of those obama era officials including the president himself are back in the white house uh, showing the world that they didn't learn any lessons from 2014 uh, worse, when uh, the Biden administration had done everything in its power to support the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, uh, that, that this was going on, this project would line the pockets of Putin. We all know what this would do and the results that they, they would have. Uh, many of my Democrat colleagues were quick to criticize President Trump, claiming that he didn't do enough initially to push back harder on the Russian aggression. Uh, and then now they realize that uh, how much more he did than the Democrats did during their time frame. Now, I'd hope to pass our uh, pass bipartisan support for Ukraine that would continue, but sadly, uh, it, it has not. Last week, many of my Democrat colleagues opposed the legislation that would have stopped the pipeline. Uh, deterrence is critical because we know that uh, Russia won't stop with Ukraine. And uh, when I was in, in uh, Romania last summer, they made that very clear. They, they may be talking about Ukraine right now, but I'm next. And I think most of the others uh, agree with that. So that's the major problem that we have right now. That, um, that my last comment would be that the administration has finally started taking this admit, uh, situation more seriously, but they're mostly focused on what the U.S. would do after Russia invades, not what are they going to do to stop Russia from invading. Uh, Senator Risch. Thanks, Jim. Uh, well, first of all, let me say that uh, uh, to start with, a number of us spent about an hour with the president this morning talking about this issue and uh, the path forward. Uh, th the first thing, and I want to underscore this, uh, for people who are listening around the world, and that is, uh, th this country, uh, our, our Congress, uh, the administration are unified in their opposition to what Russia is doing. Now, we continue to robustly discuss what the response to that should be. Uh, those of us that are on Foreign Relations and Intelligence Committee have watched this deteriorate over the last four months, and uh, it is disheartening to see that uh, the trajectory is in the wrong direction. It's really important that the, tra the trajectory be reversed. And the only way that's going to happen is if we start uh, acting now. And uh, the uh, diplomacy has gone on for a long time. Uh, the uh, Putin has not come off his uh, number one uh, demand, and that is that uh, uh, there be assurances that the Ukraine uh, and other countries not be admitted to NATO. Uh, to Putin, I would say, you have no control over this whatsoever. This is in the hands of the Ukrainian people. It's in the hands of NATO as to who gets in and who does not. That is off the table. Uh, as far as the other negotiations are concerned, uh, they uh, have gone on as they've gone on. 
uh, progress is going in the wrong direction, and it's really time that, uh, that we start taking action to show that indeed uh, we, we do want to stop this. As Senator Inhofe uh, has indicated, the, uh, the focus now should be on stopping an invasion, not talking about what happens afterwards. What happens afterwards is not really uh, debatable. The Russians are going to have a very good first day if they invade. After that, the sledding gets very difficult, as they have found out in other places. Occupying a country is very difficult. It's expensive in uh, both blood and treasure. And uh, the president said he has pointed that out to, to, to President Putin. And uh, that's, uh, that's something that needs to be underscored as we go forward. With that, Senator Ernst. Thank you, everyone. And last week, we uh, witnessed uh, the left's actions, um, which were the election takeover hysteria. And it overshadowed what's happening right now between Russia and Ukraine. And oddly enough, with all the discussion today, Senate Democrats filibustered Yes, I said that correctly. They filibustered an effort to reinstate sanctions on the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. And tonight, they'll try and change the filibuster. Uh, this was actually a gift to Putin, their actions. It allowed the, uh, allowing the completion of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline gives Russia a very powerful means to isolate our democratic partner, Ukraine. And it's more of the Biden foreign policy doctrine, which is appeasement of our adversaries. And I've consistently urged the Biden administration to prevent completion of Nord Stream 2 and actively support and bolster Ukraine's military. Um, the Secretary of State's negotiations over the last several weeks, and it's been pretty clear, uh, they are designed to de-escalate, but they've failed. Um, because Putin doesn't take this president, they don't take his threats, and they certainly don't take his leadership seriously. They are looking at Afghanistan. And did we not learn our lesson with Afghanistan? We have 10 to 15,000 Americans in Ukraine. 10 to 15,000. And what I haven't heard from this administration is what are we doing for Americans that live in Ukraine? Again, have we not learned our lessons from Afghanistan? President Biden needs to stop appeasing Putin. He needs to stop it right now. And as my colleagues have stated, once they have pushed on an invasion into Ukraine, it's over. Lives have already been lost. Sanctions and actions need to happen now. Captain Rob Portman from Ohio. Uh, we just got back last night from a congressional delegation trip to Ukraine. It was bipartisan, led by Senator Gene Shaheen and myself. Uh, Senator Wicker, Senator Kramer were part of that congressional delegation. And this morning, we were able to attend a secure uh, briefing by the President and his team. Uh, let me echo some of the concerns that have been raised by my colleagues. We need to stand strong and unified in letting Vladimir Putin and Russia know that should there be another physical invasion of Ukraine, that the consequences will be devastating for Russia, both in terms of sanctions. We talked about Nord Stream 2 earlier. Nord Stream 2 was a bad idea. It's an even worse idea now that Russia has mobilized this massive, unwarranted force along the border of Ukraine. But the other sanctions that must be discussed publicly and made clear would go much further than just sanctioning Nord Stream 2, which of course has to happen. We also need to let Russia know that we are going to provide additional military, defensive, lethal weapons to Ukraine. Already we are doing that. And I was pleased to see, as we left Ukraine yesterday, that the C-17 landed. Uh, it was from the U.K., one of our strong allies. And it had within it uh, anti-tank weapons that Ukraine badly needs to be able to respond should 
Russia and Vladimir Putin make a terrible mistake. But we need to continue that, and should there be an additional invasion, we need to let the world know that there will be substantially more of those kinds of military weapons and assistance provided to Ukraine, as well as additional buildup of NATO forces in other Eastern European countries, and a commitment, an ironclad commitment, that the free world, not just the United States, not just NATO, but that the free world will stand strong. That is the kind of deterrence that's needed right now to avoid what would be a terrible consequence for Ukraine, but also destabilizing Europe and sending a signal that somehow, after the first territorial incursion since World War II, uh, that the countries of the free world are not going to stand together strongly against what Russia is doing. I believe what we saw in our CODEL, what we heard this morning, was a very strong message, a message of unity. We need to be sure that our actions back up our words. Senator Wicker. Thank you, Senator Portman. Uh, and I think if, if, if we all try to limit our remarks, it uh, will give us a chance to, to be heard. Uh, I want to echo what Senator Portman said and what Senator Risch said. Uh, we're, this group is uh, we're partisan Republicans. But the delegation that we sent on the 48-hour trip to Kiev this, uh, this weekend was bipartisan. Uh, four Democrats, three Republicans, and our, and our message was the strong message that Senator Risch just spoke to, uh, to the rest of the world. We are united in our opposition to what uh, Vladimir Putin and Russia uh, are about to do, and we want to stand strong in a united way as a country. I think that was the message coming out of the classified meeting we had uh, with the President, and I hope that comes to fruition. Let me say this about Vladimir Putin. Uh, the, the Russian people are led by uh, someone who is nostalgic about the czarist period of Russia. President Reagan correctly called the USSR an evil empire. Vladimir Putin is nostalgic for a return to the evil empire, and that is why he's done what he's done. And yes, he poisons political opponents. He assassinates former members of the administration who oppose him uh, publicly. Uh, he uh, has invaded Georgia. He has invaded Ukraine. And as of yet, no one has given Vladimir Putin a bloody nose for any of this. I think the alliance, the, our friends in NATO, and a bipartisan majority are, uh, are prepared to assist Ukraine in making sure that if it happens this time, Vladimir Putin will get a bloody nose. Um, this is 40 million people who remember how it used to be not to be free and to be under the thumb of Soviet Russia. They will fight, and it gladdened my heart, as Senator Portman said, to see that cargo plane from the United Kingdom offloading anti-tank weapons we need to be uh, an integral part of doing more than has already been announced. And we need to make sure that if Vladimir Putin takes this step and makes this mistake for his countrymen and this mistake against his neighbors, that it will be a mistake that he will long regret and long remember. Senator Kramer. Well, thank you. Uh, and in the spirit of unity, let me agree <laughs> with all of my colleagues to this point and just reiterate how strong the commitment is. And while we certainly have some honest policy disagreements, particularly with regard to the sanctions, uh, the Nord Stream 2 sanctions and the sequence, uh, that should not be mistaken by Vladimir Putin or Russia as disunity in our resolve to stand with the people of Ukraine and to stand with freedom. Um, the, the trip was fast but intense. Uh, this morning's briefing with the President was uh, informative and I think constructive. And, uh, and I think uh, at this point, the, uh, the message is loud and clear. The United States stands as one in unity with the freedom-loving people of Ukraine and never wants a return to what is, of course, Vladimir Putin 
Putin's dream of, uh, of reuniting Ukraine as part of the Russian Empire. I think with that, um, that said, it's best if we move on, and I think Senator Fisher's next. I agree with my colleagues. I think Senator Kramer uh, did an excellent job of laying this out, that even though you only see Republicans up here, there is bipartisan support in having President Putin understand that we are firm in our resolve. I thank my colleagues for meeting with the administration as well. Uh, obviously, we all know uh, that President Putin is putting up false flags. He has 100,000 or more people at the border, troops at the border. He has been saying that NATO is there to envelop Ukraine. It is seen by him as, as a threat to his country. Uh, recently, we had one of our strongest allies step forward and on the floor of his parliament and in an op-ed the defense secretary ben wallace made excellent points to combat that misinformation that president putin uh, is is trying to get out there and get in the press to justify some future action that he may take first of all as secretary wallace has said NATO is, to its core, defensive in nature. At the heart of the organization is Article 5, which obliges all members to come to the aid of fellow member if they're under attack. Mutual self-defense is NATO's cornerstone. Now, Ukraine is not a member of NATO, and NATO is not out there trying to recruit Ukraine. And there is absolutely nothing, no proof out there that the objective is for NATO to encircle the Russian Federation. Only five of the 30 allies that neighbor Russia, with just one sixteenth of its borders, are abutted by NATO. If the definition of being surrounded is 6% of your perimeter being blocked, that's that's pretty amazing. So that knocks down another of President Putin's points. Last, as the Secretary says, the Kremlin attempts to present NATO as a Western plot to encroach upon its territory. But in reality, the growth in alliance membership is the natural response of those states to its own malign activities and threats. This would be a decision, as it should be, by the people of Ukraine. Our mission here is to be able to, to make the point to President Putin that the road he seems to be on infringes upon that sovereignty of that country and upon the Ukrainian people. Well, I am here, and I believe my colleagues are here today uh, because we, like every American, uh, are cheering for our Commander-in-Chief to be successful, uh, to help protect our values and interests uh, as Americans. And one of the things that's really important that we do is, is uh, that we incentivize and we encourage this President to be resolute as we deal with uh, the current situation. This could be a fulcrum moment in um, world politics and, and um, international relations. We have 100,000 troops that the Russians have, have deployed on the border uh, with Ukraine. And if a message is not sent to Vladimir Putin, the strongest possible message uh, that uh, every encroachment he met, makes will be met with incredible pain, in order to dissuade his, his encroachments, then this sends this sends a, a message to not only our, our allies uh, in the transatlantic uh, partnership that we have, but also it sends a message to other thugs and autocrats around the world uh, who have designs on other pieces of territory, 
Vladimir Putin has, has demonstrated over the last two decades uh, in Crimea, in eastern Ukraine, in Georgia, that uh, he has a voracious and uh, massive appetite for territory. But he is not the only one. Uh, if the United States does not stand firm uh, at this moment in time, in this place, and in this situation, then we could see encroachments uh, that will impact our commerce, uh, our way of life uh, in the future. The U.S. still remains uh, the world leader, the protector of our, our international system. We do not have a self-regulating order. Uh, we must make order. This administration must understand uh, that we continue to carry that burden of leadership. Uh, I encourage them to do so. Uh, that has been undermined in recent days. Uh, in, in our failure uh, as a country to reimpose economic sanctions on, on Putin's Nord Stream 2 pipeline. But we have an opportunity here to restore our credibility, to rest restore deterrence, not just in Ukraine, but also in so many other areas of the world. And I encourage this president and this administration to stand firm. Senator Cotton. Today, more than 100,000 Russian troops are encircling Ukraine on Russian territory, in the Black Sea, <coughs> on Belarus, for that matter, in Ukrainian territory, in Crimea and the Donbas. Uh, they could invade Ukraine at a moment's notice, not weeks, not days, but a moment's notice, waiting perhaps for nothing more than favorable weather conditions. That didn't just happen. It is the result of a year of Joe Biden's impotence and incompetence towards Russia in particular and in foreign policy more generally. One of President Biden's first actions in public office last January was to grant Vladimir Putin his number one priority, which is a no strings attached extension of a one-sided nuclear arms treaty. Then granting him his second priority, letting him complete the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. Then looking the other way at the colonial pipeline hack. And then of course, Vladimir Putin saw Joe Biden's incompetence in Afghanistan last August, and he's concluded that the time is right to achieve this long held goal. Now, it has to be said that many of our allies have been standing with Ukraine, but one ally in particular has not, and that's the nation of Germany. Germany continues to insist that Nord Stream should go forward. They refuse to be specific about the kinds of sanctions and penalties Vladimir Putin should face if he invades Russia. There were even reports this weekend that Germany did not allow that British aircraft transporting defensive missiles to Ukraine to cross German airspace. The time is late, but the only, the only way we could possibly deter Vladimir Putin from invading Ukraine is to take action now, like providing Ukraine with more anti-tank missiles and with anti-aircraft weapons, defensive weapons that would not be used offensively, would only be used against Russia if Russia chooses to invade. By reimposing sanctions now on Nord Stream 2 and being very specific about the kinds of consequences Russia will face should it invade. Sanctions on its entire energy sector, being cut off from the international banking system, and the oligarchs who both benefit from and prop up Putin's rule facing sanctions themselves and visa bans in Western Europe. Those may not be enough, but that is the only thing at this moment that could perhaps change Vladimir Putin's cost-benefit analysis, because right now, he believes the benefits of invading Ukraine will far outweigh the costs. We have to change that. Senator Scott. Joe Biden's act of being Mr. Nice Guy and appeasing everybody, appeasing his dictators, has got to end. He's got to start acting in the best interest of American citizens and our allies. Uh, he's got to get a backbone. He's got to quit appeasing uh, Putin. It hasn't, it hasn't worked. So step one, he's got to right now implement sanctions to stop Nord Stream 2. And number two, he's got to do everything he can with U.S. assets, with assets of our allies, to make sure the Ukrainians can defend themselves. If he doesn't, he's going to, we're, going to have, we're going to watch Putin do the wrong thing, and we're going to watch other dictators and thugs around the world do the wrong thing. So hopefully this president will finally step up and say his act of being Mr. Nice Guy in appeasement doesn't work, and he'll change. Senator Corden. <coughs> Historically, wars are easy to start and they're hard to finish. That's why this threat of sanctions after the fact uh, is not alone enough to uh, deter Vladimir Putin. 
uh, and to prevent him from invading, further invading Ukraine. Not, neither are the uh, promises of financial assistance to the uh, to the Ukrainians at some indetermined undetermined position or time in the future sufficient to deter Putin. And make no mistake about it, our goal on a bipartisan basis should be to stop Putin and to make him think twice about invading Ukraine. One of the things that we should do is to consider whether we ought to as we did in World War II, make the United States once again the arsenal of democracy and provide, along with our allies, uh, lethal weapons with which to deter uh, and to defeat Vladimir Putin's invasion. There's no question that weakness or perception of weakness is a provocation to authoritarian figures like Vladimir Putin or President Xi. And you can bet your bottom dollar that President Xi is watching what's happening in Ukraine and calculating what the United States response might be if uh, they were to invade Taiwan. So our goal ought to be to stop Vladimir Putin, not to try to punish him after the fact, after he's already initiated a war, but to stop him and deter him, letting him know that the democracies around the world will join together in providing the Ukrainians everything they need with which to defeat the Russian invasion and uh, to restore their democracy. Senator Rounds. I have the opportunity to serve on both the Armed Services Committee and the Foreign Relations Committee. Um, let me begin by just simply saying that this group of, of, of United States senators here stand in unison, in, in unison when we talk about our foreign policy. Just to summarize, number one, we support what Secretary Blinken said today about the fact that we stand solidly with our friends, the citizens of Ukraine. We welcomed his strong comments this morning. Second of all, when President Biden announced in February that he would not enforce sanctions on Nord Stream 2, it was met by Mr. Putin immediately beginning in March to amass soldiers and supplies on the Ukrainian border. Not acceptable. We strongly recommend that as a response to that, that sanctions be imposed and that there should be a cost to Mr. Putin and his activities in and around Ukraine. Furthermore, it is critical, and you've heard this from almost all of us, it is critical that we provide defensive capabilities to our allies in Ukraine as they courageously defend their country against the threat of a Russian invasion. And finally, we're not looking for war. We want the diplomatic activity to continue, and as a body, we support a diplomatic response and a final outcome without bloodshed. Diplomacy is critical, but Mr. Putin has to understand that he cannot he simply cannot use aggression to reshape Europe. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Rounds. I think that covers most of us here. Questions? And I'd ask and uh, invite our members to get up a little closer here. Yes. Thanks. Um, so what is it that your caucus is proposing? I've heard talk about more than two sanctions. But even if the president did go along and sanction a small number of Swiss and German business people, what would stop Moscow from re-engineering it and putting in new business people who wouldn't be affected by acid freezes? Uh, Senator Menendez has a sanctions bill, so there's Senator Rubio. Are you thinking about bringing them together soon for like a, a consensus bill? Rob, do you have more talking? Well, I said earlier, Nord Stream 2 pipeline was a bad idea long before the massive and unwarranted and provocative buildup of military forces along Ukraine's border. Now it's a terrible idea. Uh, it was a bad idea initially because it gives Russians a tremendous weapon. It's an energy weapon and makes Europe uh, dependent on Russia. We've seen what happens to Ukraine, to Moldova more recently. Uh, Russia uses it as a political weapon. Um, I disagree with you that imposing the right kind of sanctions uh, could be circumvented. Uh, I also believe that the new German government is re-looking at this. 
uh, particularly the Green Party uh, as part of their coalition, but also the Social Democrats. And what I hope all of us agree with, I think we do, Senator Cotton spoke to this, is that we want Germany to step up and to ensure that we do not see this pipeline be completed. It not only creates this dependency by Europe on Russia, it also hurts Ukraine in a very fundamental way. The existing pipeline goes through Ukraine that provides much of this natural gas. Uh, Ukraine gets fees from that. Uh, more importantly, in a way, it's an insurance policy because this is something Russia cares about. And then finally, of course, it provides natural gas to the people of Ukraine. So this is a bad idea that's become an even worse idea, and we believe that sanctions are appropriate. We, as, we also believe that Germany needs to step forward, understanding that Ukraine is a sovereign, independent country whose territorial integrity is being threatened. They're also a part of greater Europe. And uh, I agree with my colleagues that it doesn't end here if we do not take strong action to deter Russia from making a terrible mistake. Let me take a quick shot at this. First of all, I disagree with your uh, premise that it can't be stopped. It can be stopped uh, and will be stopped if the administration takes the action that, uh, that it should take and should have taken some time ago. But let's not get the Nord Stream 2 thing lost in the overall objective here, and that is to see that an invasion does not take place. There's a couple other things we've urged the administration to do. They are taking action in that regard, I think uh, delinquently, but, uh, but they are. Uh, we have additional uh, defensive measures that are uh, weaponry that is being uh, uh, that's headed for the Ukraine as we speak. In addition to that, uh, a couple of our allies have asked for uh, uh, relief from their licenses so that they can provide material. I understand that that's being done, and uh, bless the UK for uh, stepping up and, uh, and doing what they're doing. Can I ask about the Menendez bill? I know one of you brought it up, and you're talking about this idea of bipartisan unity on proposing what Putin is doing. What do you think the chances are of turning that into some sort of legislative action, either with the Menendez? bill as a vehicle for that. I know, Senator Kramer, you have expressed some support for what Menendez wants to do in that package, and the leadership has said that they're open to reasonable additions and modifications to that from Republican members. Uh, what do you think the chances are of turning that into a, a, a bipartisan legislative, legislative package? Well, there are members of both parties discussing that uh, in the relevant committees. I, I think passing something is better than passing nothing. I think passing Menendez instead of Rubio is, is not as good as passing Rubio. That said, I think if we can get the two parties together and we ought to work on it now and we ought to work on it hard and we ought to work on it fast and it ought to include everything. I think Senator Cotton listed a, a number of them, including SWIFT, cutting off SWIFT, uh, access to the global uh, electronic payment system. It's got to be severe and it's got to be broad, uh, broad based. The, the sequence is, is a debatable issue. It, it's uh, a disagreement. I think we can strengthen some parts of it, more like we'd like it, uh, agree to some of the things that, that uh, the Democrats want. But at the end of the day, I think we need to get to a package that, that is decisive and that is enough to be a deterrent to action. And uh, again, getting back to Nord Stream 2, it never should have been built. It's ha it has handed uh, Vladimir Putin leverage he should never have had. That said, that said, um, it is now a source of revenue for Vladimir Putin that, if it is stopped, um, can, can still hurt. And we need to be committed to that. And we need Germany to say publicly that they're committed to that. Senator, may I ask about another aggression that only happened a couple of days ago? Another uh, one, another very important ally on Portland for the U.S., the UAE. It happened from Houthi, a group supported and backed by Iran. It was very frightening and absurd on civilian facilities. So, what's your comment on that? Yeah, I, I, we're, we're talking about Ukraine here today. We'll take that up at another time. During your trip to Ukraine, um, the Ukrainians asked for any specific weaponry, either offensive or defensive, that the Biden administration is not taking off the table. Uh, Ukrainians were very pleased that. President Biden uh, chose to use his authority to provide additional funding for defensive lethal weapons. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, they talked about anti-tank and anti-aircraft uh, weaponry. And uh, it should be noted that the United States Congress acted in the National Defense Authorization Bill, which all of these gentlemen supported, to increase funding for military aid as well. So you have both the President's ability to transfer funds, which he has done recently 
and that's resulted in additional weaponry. Uh, but also in the National Defense Authorization Bill and in our appropriation bill, you're going to see an increase in funding for military assistance. The point being made this morning uh, by my colleagues, which I agree with, is that we need to do even more. You know, we're, we are in a position of being able to help Ukraine defend itself. I will say, too, that whether it's Denmark, whether it's the UK, whether it is other countries in Eastern Europe, including Bulgaria, the Baltics, and so on, a number of countries are stepping up and providing uh, ammunition, providing weapons, and so on. And, and as I said earlier, that's encouraging. We need to be sure that we are unified as a free world. Senator, is there a specific number you're looking for then, or is there, is there just, is there any number that we're looking at which, which would be enough, or is it just we need to move more? We had an increase in 50 million in the NDAA, and we would like to see even more. To, to be honest, if we had a chance to offer amendments to the NDAA, which was not possible, um, I think we all would have voted for it. We would have had a bipartisan support for even more. And so my hope is in the appropriations process we can do even more. Senator, maybe we can uh, take on something along the lines of uh, it's possible that a cyber attack may be enough justification in itself to withhold the sanctions if intelligence shows with certainty that they were done on the part of Russia. Anybody has been in communication with the White House where they are maybe on that side? Um, well, I don't think there's much confusion about where these cyber attacks against Ukraine are coming from. It's like the colonial pipeline hack as well. Attribution is not that difficult, is that the president doesn't appear to want to follow through on the sanctions. He has more than enough power to take the steps we've outlined here, whether it's sanctioning Russia and some of these cyber actors for those attacks, providing not just anti-tank but anti-aircraft weaponry imposing sanctions on Nord Stream 2, threatening the kind of sanctions that only America can lead on. He has more than enough power to do those things right now. The problem is that he's been waiting for too long and we are now at the precipice of a potential invasion of Russia. It, it may not be too late to act. That's why he needs to act right now. If I could as well, I, I've served as both the chairman of the the uh, Subcommittee on Cybersecurity and now as ranking member. Several years ago, we incorporated for the administration a, 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 the implementation of NSPM 13, National Security Policy Memorandum 13, under the Trump administration. It's still in effect today. It's a classified document, but it lays out very clearly that we have provided the opportunity for uh, cyber operations in a, in, in a non-war zone. And the purpose for that is to be able to send a message to people like Mr. Putin, that if he's going to engage in cyber operations that are detrimental to other countries, he can expect retaliation. And we have that capability today, and it is critical that President Biden retain that and utilize it when necessary to respond to cyber operations. Mr. Putin has the ability right now to damage transportation systems, utility systems, uh, all, all sorts of items that you would normally rely on, financial payment systems and so forth within, within Ukraine. He has shown a propensity to use cyber operations prior to his engagements on, on, on a physical level uh, in, in order to soften things up. Uh, clearly, he is looking at that at this time in uh, Ukraine. He has used it elsewhere. We followed what he has done. It is consistent with his operations in, in other areas of the world. And most certainly, Mr. Biden, President Biden, has the opportunity and the resources to respond accordingly with, with cyber operations. I'd like to hear from Senator Risch on this because he's, he's got his own legislation. And what we want to do is have a bipartisan bill that expresses the strong unified position of this Congress, which we saw on our delegation where we had four Democrats, three Republicans, taking the same message to the people of Ukraine and to the, the Russian government, saying that we are going to impose devastating sanctions should this occur and that we are going to provide additional military assistance to Ukraine, and we are going to help with regard to the other countries in the region to provide for their defense. And uh, all of this, you know, is something that we agree with on a bipartisan basis. 
I think the legislation you're talking about was done in response, in effect, to the Nord Stream 2 issue. Uh, obviously, we're going to have some differences on that, and Senator Kramer spoke about that. But that, that's not going to keep us from coming up with a strong bipartisan bill that makes it clear that we stand with the freedom-loving people of Ukraine. Are you guys doing that now? Are you working on we're that? We're working on There's that. There's discussions out there going on, ongoing right now. Thank you. Senator, what was the overall response to the information you provided to the administration this morning in the secure briefing? Okay. You know, I, I thought it was a very instructive and constructive discussion. I don't think we surprised the president or uh, Mr. Sullivan or anybody in the administration with what we what we said. And, and quite honestly, we listened as much as we as we spoke. Um, for example, with, with the in the area of sanctions, which is what we're discussing, um, Rob is exactly right. Uh, we want to have a strong bipartisan sanctions package and melding existing legislation together, um, strengthening it from our standpoint, uh, I think you could have an overwhelming vote. But if, if they choose to just you know, have a watered down sanctions package, I don't know how, how, how strong the vote will be. But I want a big vote because that again expresses the, the unity. But, and Tom, Tom is exactly right, There's, enough has been done for us to, to punch back a little bit. And, and right now I think Vladimir Putin is saying, you know, thank you, Mr. President, but words are cheap, and, and it's time to demonstrate some action. But yes, we're working on, on, on some things together, and the President was instructive. The President raises an important point, to be fair. Sanctions don't just, they're not a bilateral or a unilateral thing. Even if it's a unilateral sanction, it, it splashes over. It's got a dynamic effect with allies, with our, you know, our own exporters. Uh, so so we, have to, we have to be thoughtful about it. Um, we have to be committed to it. We have to be clear about it, um, but uh, yeah, I th he listened attentively. I, he he shared a lot as well. Um, w one of the challenges that's come up many times is that he, he has the additional burden of keeping NATO together, and right now, you know, there's at least one outlier. And and while NATO's united against a common adversary, they're not all united at the same level of intensity. And so um, we want to, you know, we want to be able to be as uni united, both as the United States of America and the United States Congress, and with our NATO allies. And it's not quite as simple as just, um, you know, a, a uni unilateral uh, group of sanctions. Can I make one other point on the legislation? Under the leadership of Senator Risch and Senator Menendez, we have already passed out of committee the Ukraine Security Partnership Act. That's in addition to what we're talking about now. Uh, we would most likely be able to fold that in to any new legislation. That includes, among other things, additional capability to help Ukraine with regard to cyber attacks, as an example, something we saw, unfortunately, occur last week. So that legislation has already been reported at a committee. It hasn't been voted on the floor yet. So there, there is strong bipartisan support for helping Ukraine, and there is there's a lot of legislative activity that I think could be brought together. Is your question uh, whether or not this is a provocative act that might cause the Russians to move? Listen, they need to set that aside. Uh, we, don't, we don't need to be uh, calculating what's going to provoke the Russians. We know uh, where we stand, where we want to go. The Russians know where they stand and where they want to go. Uh, it, it's way past time to be dithering over whether something is going to upset Putin or not. That's off the table as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, let's not forget that the escalation of all this has come from one side, not the other. The peace-loving, freedom-loving Ukrainians, uh, NATO, the United States of America, none of us have escalated this situation. And every attempt to de-escalate it with, with uh, um, diplomatic attempts, which, of which there have been many, just several just in the last week or two, um, have clearly not, uh, have not deterred Vladimir Putin. So the time for that discussion is long past. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you.